Guys, quick story time before we get into this, because as I was getting ready for this video, I was like, I want to dress nice, you know, I want to put some effort into my content. I was feeling a little bit inspired, right? And then the craziest thing happened as I was, you know, looking at different outfits to try on to show off in this video, a wizard broke into my apartment. And I, I actually knew he was a wizard before I saw him because he broke in through the window and I live on the third floor and also he was levitating and had a very tall wizard's hat. So I figured he was a wizard. And he broke in and he put a spell on me and he said, ooh, ooh, no matter what you put on, you're gonna wanna have a freak out and rip all your hair out and break all the bones in your hands with a hammer unless you wear this hoodie. The same hoodie I have worn multiple times a week, every week for the past two years. Um, and guys, I, it's not my fault. It's the wizard's fault that I uh, look like this today. Anyway, hello and welcome back to my channel. So, do you guys remember maybe like a year or so ago whenever Asian fishing or East Asian baiting was like a really big thing on TikTok and a lot of e-girls were getting accused of Asian baiting? Do you remember that? Okay, if you don't remember, Asian baiting was an accusation thrown at people who would allegedly, I guess I should say allegedly, use things like makeup, contacts, um, different filters, uh, hair dyes, all of this to make themselves appear more East Asian, particularly Korean. That discourse may have died down as the trend of Asian fishing seemingly has as well, but did you know that there is an even nicher, more intense group of people particularly younger Gen Zs who genuinely believe that they can change their race and are actively trying to. Did you know that? <laughs> no. No, it's like, like it's a popular? No, it's a niche. Okay. But it, I mean, it's popular enough for me to talk about it. I do think the hashtag on TikTok, RCTA, uh, is probably in the millions of views, I think, but that also includes people just talking about it. But RCTA, or race change to another, is very similar to the concept of being transracial. And for reference, a transracial person, as identified by Wikipedia, is one who identifies as a different race than the one associated with their biological ancestry. They may adjust their appearance to make themselves look more like that race and may participate in activities associated with that race. RCTA is that exact thing with a superiority complex and like repackaged for Gen Z. And you might be wondering if they're basically the same, why don't I just examine transracialism instead of focusing on this niche? And the reason I want to focus on RCTA specifically is the specifics. RCTA people identifying people are, again, just from what I've seen, this is all my observation and gatherings from the internet, so don't take what I say as fact, but from what I've seen, RCA RCTA identifying people are almost explicitly American or white European, oh. teenaged or around the teen age, so like a little younger, a little older, uh, transitioning to Korean or Japanese, but it's almost always Korean. And I was thinking about this a while ago, and I, I was just perplexed. Like, I, I couldn't really grasp this phenomena, because what do you mean you think watching subliminals on YouTube and changing oh. your display name to Mina is gonna make you Korean? Subliminals on <laughs> me trying to turn myself into a mermaid when I was nine. <laughs> so today we are going to be getting right into it and dissecting this concept of being race change to another. Right after a quick talk about climate change brought to you by today's sponsor, the Better Internet Initiative. Guys, the average person and the experts are agreeing on something. The fact that this summer was f***ing hot. 2023 is the hottest year on record, and there's also new evidence that global warming has accelerated over the past 15 years. That acceleration means the effects of climate change that we've already been seeing, like these massive heat waves, as well as wildfires and rising sea levels, all of which we are only going to keep seeing in increasing severity as time goes on. And this is something that's going to affect all of us in different ways. Whether you like it or believe it or not, it will. But I want to talk specifically to the people that are eating oysters, which might sound a little weird, but hear me out. There's a bacteria that affects raw oysters called Vibrio that causes serious gastrointestinal illness in people. Vibrio isn't a new threat or anything, but it grows in warm water, meaning that as oceans get warmer, Vibrio can grow more. In fact, it's already spread to parts of the world that it was never seen before. Sorry to call just the oyster eaters out there for a second, because it's not just about you, okay? We're all affected and are going to continue to be affected 
by climate change. But right now, I do just want to talk about sea life. And this isn't going to be like vegan propaganda or anything, but I am vegan. And in the past, I've thought about going pescatarian where I can eat seafood and stuff because I really like sushi. I do really love seafood. But what's actually stopped me from being pescatarian is the seafood industry and its very large contributions to climate change. Overfishing is a huge issue all around the world. In Europe, over 40% of the different fish populations are overfished in the Northeast Atlantic Ocean, and around 90% are overfished in the Mediterranean. According to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, the global number of overfished stocks has tripled in half a century, and today one third of the world's fisheries are being pushed beyond their biological limits. Not only does this hurt our climate in the unnecessary removal of so many sea creatures that are structurally important to the ocean's ecosystem, but it's also contributing to the rise in temperatures too, both in the air and water. The ocean absorbs over 25% of all carbon emissions and over 90% of the excess heat that humans generate. And on top of that, fish also contribute 16% of the total carbon flux in the ocean's carbon cycle. A carbon flux is basically like a, a movement, a fluctuation. It's the transferring of carbon to one of the several different things on earth that can hold carbon, such as land, the air, oceans, and living beings. So fish contribute 16% to that carbon fluctuation in the carbon cycle. So when they're removed from the ocean, not only does it upset the ocean's carbon cycle, how it transfers carbon, which is essential to us, they give it to us by the way. It also adds more carbon from the ocean into the atmosphere. Plus on top of that, fishing fleets emit millions of tons of carbon each year from burning fuel. Just the European Union alone emits 7.3 million tons per year. So again, not to be vegan propaganda, but the ocean and the creatures in it are very important to the cycle of life, the cycle of carbon, and keeping our planet running and keeping it healthy. But the fishing industry does so much damage despite how much the ocean does for us. And I feel like people don't really realize how much the ocean does for us. I took an oceanography class in college and it was super awesome. The ocean is crazy. There is some good news though about this whole thing. I didn't just come to say this sucks and anyway. The Inflation Reduction Act is the largest investment in climate change in the United States, which includes $369 billion in investments in climate and clean energy programs. It's not the perfect fix and we are still very far away from our climate goals, but we are making positive steps and important progress. The future of our climate is up to us, which is why I think it's so important to push for more regulations that protect our planet and when applicable, make Make changes in your own life as well. Food for thought, care about the oceans, please, and let's get back into the video. Again, before I get into my deep dive, don't take what I say as fact. This quote unquote information I have gathered is just from random places on the internet, like Tumblr. I'm using Tumblr as a source. Okay, so take what I say with a grain of salt. This is a bit of a smaller online phenomenon, so there's not too many definitive sources or facts on it. So what I present is, again, just my findings and opinion. There's not a very clear way to track the origin of RCTA, especially since it's so closely intertwined with transracialism in concept. I would like to say I did find a post or two alleging that the concept of RCTA was made up by a right-wing turf to inadvertently mock trans people, but I couldn't find proof of that. Someone linked a TikTok that apparently had proof, but when I got to it, the video wasn't there. So that is a possibility, but I'm not sure. I really don't know where RCTA came from, but I would say that this phenomena of East Asian transracialism and eventually RCTA started with the rise and popularization of K-pop in the West. K-pop is becoming more and more popular outside of Korea. That cannot be argued with, especially in America. And it's not hard to see the appeal of K-pop, even if I wasn't a K-pop stan, which, yeah, sorry. K-pop stan. But even if I wasn't, I think I would still see the appeal of K-pop. Because the agencies and the big, big money behind K-pop craft everything about it to be likable. 
Idols train for sometimes months, but usually years, with some K-pop idols debuting after over a decade of training, and some, but a lot, actually, never debuting at all. During this time as a trainee, they're basically built from the ground up. Not always, it depends. It's said that some idols have to, you know have their personalities trained a little longer. But this training goes beyond the basics of like giving them dance lessons and a stage name. Sometimes these idols are given brand new personalities, plastic surgeries, classes on how to take selfies, PR, presentability, and so on. And then once a group debuts, there's even more than that because it's not enough to program someone to be as appealing as possible. There has to be branding around it, which is why so many groups have assigned colors to members, cute animals assigned to members. Like you might have heard of like the bunny member. That's a really popular one. Collectible pictures of the members for you to buy. You will maybe see some on my shelf. You can win fan calls with the members. There are dance challenges to the songs, etc. And I don't bring that up to imply that the K-pop industry is like grooming young American girls into wanting to be Korean or that it's the K-pop industry that's asking for this to happen with how much they tend to target the teen girl slash young adult audience, just so we're clear. But we do need to acknowledge the influence of K-pop since there's, at least from what I've seen, an undeniable connection between these people who are claiming to be RCTA from whatever race they are currently to Korean and being a K-pop fan. I haven't seen one that wasn't a K-pop fan actually. But again, K-pop is not a direct cause of RCTA and K-pop was popular in the West for years before the popularization, if you could even call it that, of RCTA, which according to Google Trends actually started to gain traction around May of this year, 2023, but that's based on just Google searches. It was relevant on TikTok before that. So I would say that RCTA started to gain traction around the end of 2022 slash the beginning of this year, 2023. But what does it actually mean when someone says that they identify as race change to another? Is it really just kids wanting to be another race because they have a romanticized or even a fetishized view of that race? Well, yes, but that's not what they would tell you. When I ask what it means to be RCTA, I mean how would an RCTA identifying person describe it themselves. And from what I've seen, an RCTA person is someone who would say that they feel uncomfortable or disconnected from their own race or ethnicity, and they feel connected to another and believe slash want to believe that they can transition into that race by doing things like consuming parts of the culture associated with that race slash ethnicity, using products made for or by that ethnicity, watching subliminals, and doing things to alter their appearance to look more like that race. For example, someone transitioning, transitioning in very big air quotes, from American to Korean, that's just gonna be my example for this video because it's the most common case. They would try to learn the Korean language and social norms, eat South Korean dishes, dye their hair black, draw on an egg yosol, use subliminals to try and develop a natural egg yosol, and of course stream TXT's latest release, the name chapter Freefall. <laughs> I've mentioned subliminals a few times now and I do want to talk about them because subliminals are actually a huge part of dare I call it RCTA culture? <laughs> I'll call it lore. Subliminals are a big part of RCTA lore. And I think it's one of the things that actually separates RCTA from transracialism in the specifics. RCTA identifying people often use subliminals to change their facial features like their eye shape, uh, lips, hair texture. Some are more all-encompassing, like this one titled The Most Powerful Korean Subliminal. <laughs> and subliminals are a bigger beast of their own, one that Curtis Connor and probably many other YouTubers have already made videos on, so I'm not going to get too far down that rabbit hole. But subliminals are basically videos that people make that combine like audios that have certain frequencies and different pictures that match the subliminal goal. And the point is that it's like a manifestation tool for that goal. And now it can be debated on whether or not manifestation is real. I personally think it is, but whatever. But subliminals do work. Like subliminal messaging is just a thing. Marketing relies on it a lot. And studies have even shown that subliminal videos can help improve your self-esteem, reduce stress, and increase focus. However, that's because you can do all of those things if you just 
think about them hard enough and believe that you can do them. Subliminal messaging and manifestation are just tools for you to achieve a goal. They're not powers that can achieve what's not already physically possible to you. Because no, you cannot just change your race. It's not a thing. It's never been a thing. And it shouldn't ever be a thing, but I can't confidently say that it will never be a thing, unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, you can try currently, Ollie London did, but that, that doesn't just make you that race. While race is not based in biology, it's usually based on physical traits, social factors, and cultural backgrounds, which vary by location, which is why even though race isn't biological, a race is usually associated with one ethnic group, if I'm understanding correctly, and maybe I'm not because there are disagreeing sources Sources, so let me know. But regardless, many people associate race with being biological in some way. Because technically, yes, a person can, with enough money and willpower, alter their appearance to make themselves look naturally East Asian. And they can learn Korean and they can check all the boxes, but I think the majority of people, if not everyone, would still look at that person as the race that they were born as, even though, again, race isn't biological. But that wasn't really the question. I don't think anyone that learned RCTA or learned about RCTA had the follow-up question of, well, does it actually work? I think the normal follow-up or the assumed follow-up question is, why would someone want to do that? Or why do they think they can just do that? And that's what I was asking myself when I decided to make this video and look into all of it. Uh, I don't remember exactly what it was that triggered the thought, but I do remember like sitting in the car and wondering just like what makes a person think that they can do that and think that it can work. To answer whether or not they think it can work, I feel inclined to say that they actually don't. Based on what I've seen a lot of the RCTA community, they'll just feed off of each other's delusions while also feeding into theirs. But they don't actually believe that it can work. And actually, when asked about the topic, specifically people using subliminals to change their race, Assistant Professor of Culture and Media Studies, Jamie Cohen, said that it doesn't ever really work because it's not going to do anything. But they have convinced themselves that it works because there's other people who have convinced themselves as well. Which you can see when you consume RCTA content. The most concrete proof quote unquote proof there is of RCTA subliminals working is people posting like just eye, a very zoomed in picture of an eye. It's a super cropped picture of just the eye. So we don't even know if it's the same person to begin with. But also most of the time the after picture is just the same eye with like makeup that just kind of naturally elongates the eye. And that that is the best proof that people have of RCTA being a thing and subliminals actually working. And you see tons of videos and pictures like that. And the comments will be like, oh my God, I see a difference. What subliminal did you use? I can't wait for my eyes to look like that. And the original poster will respond and they'll fuel the comments that are fueling the poster. And it's just a bunch of delusional people feeding off of each other. And I know that that sounds rude, but I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of true. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that is what's happening. It's called an echo chamber. They know it doesn't work. I feel kind of safe saying that. Like, I think a lot of them really want it to work or they might, you know, say they think it can work. But I think very few people who claim to be RCTA genuinely believe in it being physically possible. So to go back to the question of why someone would want to do this, let's talk about it because I have some ideas. I think that RCTA is a bad byproduct of a mixture of social media and white fragility. This isn't to justify or to say that I understand those who claim to be RCTA, but it's not hard to see how it's formed when looking at society and social media. I know, not to be like, ugh, society. I am an INFP though, and you know who else is? The Joker. So, <laughs> society and the beauty industry both define and perpetuate the beauty standard, and through social media we're able to observe that standard and have it pushed onto us, which is why we've been able to witness the industry rotating different women's body types and physical features as what's in and as what's desirable. And since around the 2010s, it's been out with the heroin chic, high fashion stick thin models of the early 2000s and the 90s, and in with the Instagram baddie look, made up of fake tan, lip injections, body modifications with the BBL and the boob jobs. So since this is what's 
the popular thing to do now, we start to see some culture vulturing, maybe some braids from people that shouldn't wear them. Because at this time, and of course still today, since that aesthetic is still very much alive and kicking on Instagram, the blueprint for this look was and is black women who have already been sexualized for their natural features that non-black women are now paying to have because it's what's in. And we see a similar trend after things like K-pop's boom in the West and the increase in Korean media consumption in the West, aka K-dramas, both of which combine with pre-existing sexualization and fetishization of Asians, particularly Eastern Asian women, and the current beauty standards starting to also shift back into that 2000s model thinness, conveniently working together with the K-pop industry's intensely strict observation of idols' weight and appearances. So it's not a huge mystery to me that some of the new wave teens wouldn't feel very confident in themselves in this age of social media where you're subjected to anyone and everyone's opinion on your appearance at any time as you scroll through a TikTok FYP of a bunch of other people your age, but they're prettier than you and they look like they could be in a makeup ad or something and they get praised for their appearance and they have tons of followers and they have cool friends and stream Jealousy Jealousy by Olivia Rodrigo, you get it? It makes sense that a good amount of teens have self-esteem issues. And yes, I am making the claim that RCTA is in part caused by self-image issues because that's a notion I saw throughout several RCTA accounts I looked at. And if we're just being blunt, someone with self-confidence isn't trying to change their race. <laughs> However, that is just about as far as my understanding and sympathy can go because ultimately your insecurity doesn't justify the appropriation and fetishization of other races and cultures. When I was looking at different RCTA accounts, on TikTok and Tumblr, the biggest conclusion that I gathered, like the main thought that I had as I was reading stuff, was just wondering, honestly, how some people can be so entitled to think that because of their own self-image issues, they should be able to try out being Japanese and going by the name Suki. And that's ultimately what RCTA comes down to. I like this, therefore I should have it. Or in this scenario, be it. And as I mentioned, I do think white fragility plays a very big part in the functioning of RCTA. I saw a post when I was in my RCTA rabbit hole that said, I'm gonna read this whole, this whole post. Sorry, but when I hear someone say all white people are inherently racist, I lose my grip on sanity a little bit. Like, am I just not supposed to be born? And then you wonder why these white girls don't want to be white anymore. Why RCTA and trans race is a thing. Because when you say everyone in this group of people with one unchangeable physical trait are bad, no exceptions, all of them suck, people don't want to have that unchangeable trait anymore. And this post, in my opinion, very well exemplifies the overall tone of RCTA just as a concept, but there's also a lot to unpack within this post. Firstly, you are seeing the self-esteem thing, right? It's kind of self-admitted and the people don't want to have that trait anymore part. What I think is most visible though is the white fragility on top of white entitlement. The response to someone saying that white people are racist is immediately self-defense mode, what about me? What am I supposed to do? Just not be born? When that's obviously not what the hypothetical person was saying, and in the non-hypothetical, the people that genuinely believe that all white people are inherently racist are greatly outnumbered by the people that don't think that, for one. And for two, maybe controversial, but I don't think it should even matter if someone thinks all white people are inherently racist. <laughs> do I personally think that's true? No, but I can see why someone would think that just looking at, you know, history and deeply rooted systemic racism in American society. And also so many white people go through their day-to-day -day lives refusing to even acknowledge the privilege they have because of their race and the subconscious racism they might not even realize they have because they go through a society that is racist, but they don't ever have to question that view or challenge it because they don't experience racism. That's does that make sense? That's not to say you have to be that race to like understand racism or empathize. I'm saying that there are a lot of people who don't realize that certain actions, certain experiences they have that they don't question are racist or based in racism because of systemic racism. So if someone says all white people are inherently racist, I don't personally feel threatened by that because for one, I don't personally think it's true. And for two, I'm not racist. Another point in this post I want to touch on is the similar thing they do at the end with the hypothetical person saying like, every person in this group with this physical trait is bad, no exceptions, all of them suck. My thing is, 
nobody is rationally saying that. And if someone is, why are you taking what that person is saying personally when they are just objectively wrong? Like this person's opinion should hold no value to you. But going back to the self-esteem thing, you're seeking external validation. So of course that person's opinion is going to matter to you. But I think the most egregious part of this post is when they say, then you wonder why all these white girls don't want to be white anymore. Why RCTA and trans race is a thing. That part, um, just blatantly like blaming the minority group for white people fetishizing, romanticizing, and appropriating these people's identities, and then complaining that people think you're racist. I don't know, girl, two plus two is still for the last time I check. Ultimately, I think that that's what this entire trend comes down to. Fragile people using their insecurities to justify cultural appropriation, and still thinking they aren't racist because how can they be racist when the issue is that they just love that race, you know? How can that be so bad? I don't know. Racial fetishization is still in fact racist. <laughs> I don't think there's anything to like do about RCTA people. You know, this isn't like a call to action to like rally them up or something or to bully them. And the trend is already basically dying out anyway. I am late to talking about this. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't have a takeaway. I really just wanted to yap about something that had was eating my brain a few weeks ago. That's it. Let me know your thoughts. Um, maybe there's more nuance than I'm realizing that there is. So if you have a perspective that I didn't see, let me know, I guess. Um, and thank you for watching this video. And if you enjoyed it, give it a like. If you didn't enjoy it, then I don't know why you stayed till the end, but thanks for doing it anyway, dumbass. And now I am going to go. Oh, and my nail is stuck. Okay. Thank you so much for watching this video. Um, watch other videos of mine if you want to, or my second channel stuff if you want to, and follow me other places if you want to. Bye.